Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. So if you listen to On the Tape last week, we had the two dudes with four first names, Vinny Daniels and Porter Collins, Porter Collins being a crew star for the Olympic team, and they railed against me on my hatred of the Mets. Well, they have their last laugh as this week, the Yankees of New York lost to the Red Sox. I'm sure they are just basking in the glory, Danny Moses. I did have a chance to speak with them. I wanted to have them come on to the show today for a brief moment, but I think it was something like F you and go Sox, and they didn't realize how much pleasure that they could take from watching the Red Sox win a baseball game, so they wanted to pass that on. So No, and I appreciate that, Dan. I'm sure you have some thoughts. Guy, you didn't even mention anything. The episode title was what they call trolling. It was Ode to the Mets. It was a Strokes song, last song of their last album, The New Abnormal. And I would say that the Yankees are going to be in a period of a new abnormal here because... The way they limped into the end of the season, Guy, and how they got into the postseason and how they went out of it, not particularly impressive. No, not particularly impressive. I don't think we're in an Abbey normal for you young Frankenstein fans out there. And I love the Strokes. I loved it when Patti Smith or Patti Smythe was the lead singer of the Strokes. It's one of my favorite bands, by the way, Dan. And I'm sure you've seen them a number of times. I did see the Strokes. Actually, they opened Irving Plaza. They opened New York, man. Back in June, they played one of the first concerts back in New York. All right, let's get into it, Guy Adami. I mean, you know, the summer is over. Yeah, let, let's get into it. By the way, I would rather stick pins in uh, certain areas of my body than see the Strokes. Anyway, you're listening to On the Tape. As you know, I'm Guy Adami, joined as always by Dan Nathan and Danny Moses. Look, the market's crazy. We're going to be talking about that. Danny's going to rip off the tape on what he deems to be geopolitical risks. I agree. Later, Dan sits down with venture capitalist Katie Stanton of Moxie Ventures. She took that name from the movie The Sting. I am certain of that. And Melissa Lee is back. She'll take us behind the scenes of her new documentary, Generation Gamble. You don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss anything. So it's been remarkable the move in the market this week. Obviously, we saw that big downdraft earlier in the week. I thought we would trade down to 4150 in the S&P 500. That is, in fact, the 200-day moving average. We stopped at 4270 and managed to rally 150 or so S&P handles. It's remarkable the resilience of this market. Listen, I still think there's some danger ahead. Maybe it comes in the form of the jobs number. Danny, what are your thoughts? We're still in no man's land. I agree with you. At some point, the market's just going to I think Kareem lower and break through all those technical levels. We rallied because the debt ceiling issue got kicked down the road for six to eight weeks. It didn't solve anything. You could give me the jobs number right now. I wouldn't be able to tell you what the market's going to do. And I think that's the most telling thing about the market right now. The expectations are 500,000. Unemployment to be 5.1, 5.2%. doesn't matter. If I told you it was 700,000, you couldn't tell me what the market was going to do. And if I told you it was going to be 200,000, you couldn't tell me. But what I'm noticing is this. People are much more willing to accept inflation with growth as opposed to stagflation, which I think maybe is obvious, but I think people are thinking, okay, I'll accept this near-term inflation. Yes, it's no longer transitory. I'll price that in to a degree. Give me good earnings growth. Give me good company fundamentals, and I have an excuse to sell on the market. And I think more importantly than the jobs number tomorrow will be the earnings numbers we start to see in droves in the next few weeks and what their current outlook is. Guy, you said the price action was pretty remarkable and you thought 4150 to the downside, you know as well as I, and Danny knows this, it doesn't go in a straight line, especially in the sort of market that we're in right now, where there's plenty of things that you can key on to say, okay, well, you know, maybe rates moving higher is a reflection of better than expected growth, and especially with the backdrop of the fact that Q3 GDP has gone from estimates of high single digits to low single digits in just a matter of months. And a lot of people will explain that away and say, oh, we're going to get that back in Q4 or Q1, that sort of thing. So the way I think about it is that the jobs number, if it's really hot, I think that kind of speaks to what Danny just said. It's inflation with growth. It's not stagflation. If we have a number that's below trend over the last few months, and I think, what has it been, Danny, about 300,000 jobs or something like that, then you really start getting that stagflation argument. And then you have this rate move. 
I will just say this at 157 or so, which is where we are on Thursday afternoon. If Guy is right and we have a straight line move in rates in the 10 year back to those prior highs from late March, and that's because of fears of stagflation, then the stock market's going to have a problem. I think that's why we sold off. I don't think anyone thought that what was going on in Washington, we we're going to have our credit downgraded. We're going to miss the debt ceiling. I don't think that was the case here. And Danny, you've been all over this for months on this idea of stagflation. So I don't think you want to see data that points to that. Listen, you had Poland raise rates. You had New Zealand raise rates. That follows Korea, Norway, and the UK. Obviously, it's coming later this year. Look at the UK 10-year, 108, 109, some of that. has been a, a massive move. So to your point, Dan, I think inflation is being accepted now into the marketplace. And I think the result of that is I can take inflation. It's not transitory. I get it. Show me what fundamentals are going to look like. So I think the point about higher prices is really what we have to solve for when we think about Q4 guidance. We think about this earnings period. So corporations with record profit margins right now are going to have to make a decision. Do they pass through some of those increases in costs? And we know that wage inflation is one of those for many sorts of businesses. Or do they eat it and do they take a hit to margins? And when you think about some of the earnings that we've already just seen in the last few weeks, and I know we've talked about FedEx, we've talked about Nike, those micron numbers weren't particularly great. And there's a whole host of other numbers. Facebook even did a soft guide down. So I guess the point is the longer prices stay, high. If we continue to see these input costs going higher, what is the hit to corporate earnings and how long will they have poor visibility on that? I think that's really the thing that has not been corrected for in the market by a 5% peak to drop decline, which is why I do think, Guy, as we get into earnings, if there are any big high profile misses, any big ones, you sell them, man. I mean, you have to sell them. You have to sell any rally here because you're going to get to your 4150. Dan, to your point about when you see a company miss earnings, look what FedEx did. I know we've talked about this in the last few weeks. That stock is not recovering. They had a huge miss. They gave you inflationary reason why. They gave you supply chain reasons why. Look at that stock. That's a big market cap company. So I think that's evidence of potentially what we might see. It's going to be fascinating to see what happens with yields. Again, you mentioned 157, Dan. I'll be steadfast and say we're going to blow through that 175 level that we saw in March. And I do think 2% by the end of the year. I don't know what's going to happen with the broader market. I think I do. But I happen to think that rates are going higher for the wrong reasons. And we'll see. I know Danny's going to rip off the tape later about energy and some geopolitical risk. But that's out there. Facebook has been giving a lot of opportunities, a lot of people in various different manners. It traded down below 330. I'm wondering, into earnings, in your opinion, we'll talk about some of your other MAGA complex or FMAG, as you say. What does Facebook look like to you? Because everybody's talking about it. By the way, you did a dot on Facebook a while back, if you recall. You mean that Dan off the tape? That's correct. The thing with Facebook right here, guys, they can't seem to find their way home at the moment. Oh, wait a second. Slow down for a second. I see what you just did. That's really nice. Danny Moses, did you catch that? Of course. Another Steve Winwood. Another Steve Winwood. All right. There we are. I'm here for you guys. Facebook started the week off. We had been talking about this Facebook investigation by the Wall Street Journal for the last few weeks. And then finally, the whistleblower went on and revealed herself and went on 60 Minutes Sunday night. And I woke up really early. I know Danny does this every once in a while hoping that the pre-market is mispricing something. Back in the old day, Danny, when you were back in your hedge fund seat, you'd get in there really early, you'd hit the machines, and you might start shorting stuff or buying stuff if you thought it was not being appreciated, whatever the news was over the weekend. And I looked, and the thing was only down like one and a quarter percent. And then I got busy in the morning, and then I looked up, and it was down 3%. And then I looked up, it was down 5%. This was Facebook, right? Well, here's the thing, man. The stock has not made a lot of ground. We're Thursday afternoon here. The market's ripping. The S&P 500 is up about 1.5%. The Nasdaq's up 1.6%. And Facebook's basically unchanged on the week here. So to me, I don't love the idea that the stock is depressed into its earnings. And Guy, you and I used to say things like this on Fast Money, trying to be smart and everything like that. It's like, oh, well, maybe they won't put up such a big number and big guidance. But I don't think they care anymore. Do you agree with that in a way? So I don't love the fact that the stock's down a whole heck of a lot into the print because if they put up a big number and they guide a way that people that just doesn't kind of vibe with the sentiment in the stock right now, that sets up for a short squeeze. Yeah, what you're saying basically is when you're under the microscope, which they currently find themselves under, the last thing you want to do is put up some huge earnings number because then obviously that magnification gets even larger. It's like, Things in the rearview mirror are larger than they appear. Well, things appear pretty large right now. Facebook, I understand. But I think you're right. I don't think they do care, quite frankly, 
because they've learned advertisers don't leave. And quite frankly, the people on the platform don't leave. My concern, Danny, all along with Facebook has been if they fall under the guise, auspices, whatever fancy word you want to use of ESG. And if, oh, by the way, I think right now Facebook finds itself in about 250 or so ETFs. If for whatever reason there's pressure on these ETFs to get Facebook out, that's existential risk, brother. And then, you know, the dear Mr. Fantasy, this is never going to happen. See what I did there, Dan Nathan? Well, then I don't know who Katie is, although she's coming on the show later. Again, she better bar the door. Yeah, Dan was spot on two or three weeks ago when he noticed Wall Street Journal doing a series of articles on Facebook. He knew that there was momentum building against the company. I think everyone knew on Friday morning that 60 Minutes was going to run a hit piece on Facebook on Sunday. You always can find out what that's going to be. So that was obviously expected. It obviously did sell off through the day on Monday. Zuckerberg continues to sell an extraordinary amount of stock. I don't know if you guys have looked at his form fours, but it's literally 25 to $35 million a day. But listen, there's other stocks to own. So whether you want to be short this or long this, the stock's completely in no man's land. And so I think you're right. Setting up short into a quarter, which is really backwards looking, may not be the greatest thing, but there's turmoil at that company. And I do think it is in the crosshairs now of the ESG world. So I would not own it here. Whether I'd be short here is a whole different conversation. Yeah, but when you say there's other stocks to own, there are very few stocks in the entire global stock market that have some of the characteristics that this company has and valued the way that this company is. So take out Senator Blumenthal grilling their trust and safety head, whether they're going to end their policy of Finsta. The disconnect between Washington and what they're trying to regulate is absolutely astounding. We can leave that for another conversation. But I guess the point that I would just make in a market that's trading literally at 21 times, that's the S&P 500, on 2022 expectations where earnings are expected to grow about 14% and sales maybe 20% or something like that to get to $142 billion in sales, the stock is trading at a market multiple. That is basically unheard of. No question. Listen, in terms of stocks to own, I'm probably in the minority in this group, but I do think banks still provide some value. Well, although Danny probably agrees, I do think rates are going meaningfully higher. And at least in the short term, I do think that's going to give the banks some bang for their buck. Citigroup, which still trades at a discount to tangible book, which I believe is around $78 to me, is the most interesting. But Blackstone, as I've mentioned before, it's had a pretty significant sell-off. It coincided, by the way, with some of the negative news out of China, whether that's coincidence or not, I don't know, but that's exactly what's happened. And by the way, Danny, I don't think the situation in China is correcting itself anytime soon. I mentioned the other day, now they're on Fantasia's bandwagon. That's a great name, by the way. I never saw the movie, but it is a great name. What are your thoughts in China? Because it seems to be getting worse, not better. So when you see moves like you have in rates and commodities and even the stock market for that matter, You always wait a couple weeks and you hear about someone that got crushed, whether it's a bank this time or not, I don't know. But I do believe all this volatility is bringing in the element of possibility that there's some losses at some of these banks. Not a reason to go short them right now, but that's the first thing I would note. As it relates to Blackstone and the private equity funds in general, those have proven to be the best business models in the market for the last 20 years. First of all, they changed their tax structure, right? They went from partnerships to LLCs, which was smart on their part because they got broader ownership across the investment universe. But more importantly, this is long duration capital, right? This is not a mark to market event for these guys daily. So these firms can take advantage of dislocation and prove it out over a period of five to 10 years. So that's your second point. China, nowhere near out of the woods, more real estate problems have occurred. They halted trading on Evergrande now for this entire week as they continue to unload assets that they'd rather not sell, but are being forced to. There's still been no significant external debt payments being done to anyone outside of China. And I believe the largest shareholder in Evergrande, I believe, just decided to go public today. Stock obviously went higher on that, but there's a lot of moving parts over there. And the last thing, which I'll touch on a little bit in the rot, is just this geopolitical risk, which is being ignored and the amount of pilots they currently have in the military flying over Taiwan right now. So I don't know if that answers your question there, Guy, but you brought up three good points that I wanted to address. So. You mentioned Prove It. I mean, I will tell you that the fourth studio album of the great Bruce Springsteen was, in fact, Darkness on the Edge of Town. Prove It All Night, one of the songs on that album. I happen to think if I were ever stranded on a desert island, which is ridiculous because nobody gets stranded anywhere anymore, that album would be along with me. Maybe Boston's first album, definitely some Led Zeppelin, clearly. And I'm going to throw this one at you, Dan Nathan. 
Carol King's Tapestry. How do you like them apples? Yeah, not a fan of Carol King. I will say this about that darkness. Bruce does these tours every once in a while where he'll play albums cover to cover. And I caught Darkness of the Edge of Town cover to cover Stop. at the Garden back in like 2015 or 16. I think it was epic, Guy Adami. So it's not just the debt ceiling. It's not just what's going on politically, although apparently they're going to make it political with the supposed release from the SPR, which I think is mindless, but that's for another show, I guess. Energy is top of mind. And I'll tell you, the move we're seeing in energy, specifically nat gas and specifically nat gas in Europe, the fact that now we are seemingly reliant on Vladimir Putin to solve what are going to be significant problems this winter in Europe is mind boggling. That's what we find ourselves in. Danny, I know you want to go ripping off the tape about the geopolitical risks about energy, but wax poetic real quickly about what you're seeing in the space. Yeah, I mean, when you have natural gas in the U.S., forget about in Europe, moving to a 12-year high and then down 8% in one day. Dutch gas over in Europe had a 60% jump in days and then sold off 7.3% on Putin's comments, which I'll go off the tape in a second on. And then over in the U.K., a 40% jump in natural gas and then a 7.4% drop. Those are massive volatile move in what should be liquid markets, per se. But we've seen oil move, not to that degree, obviously. It's a much more liquid market, no pun intended. But these have massive impacts on how companies think about their business operations. And if they trying to forecast business themselves based upon an input cost, let's set aside trading commodities for a second and let's go with you. You had to actually incorporate those costs into your business plan. So yeah, it's having massive impact. And obviously inflation, and we talk about crude oil, energy and inflation, they go hand in hand. But what a lot of people either fail to realize or don't want to acknowledge, so much of food, the components of food and food inflation are contingent upon what's going on in energy. Dan, I know you have some thoughts in terms of crude. I think you think it's going to fail here. You obviously drew a beautiful 13-year downtrend line that over the summer we traded up to and failed. Crude sold off about 20%, I think in about a two and a half week period of time. But here we are back at that trend line. Some would say we broke to the upside. Others would say we're failing here. Thoughts on crude before Danny rips off the tape. Well, I mean, listen, you traded crude back in the 70s when you had all those supply demand disruptions, stagflation, the whole shebang. It is an industrial commodity, right? And I'm not smart enough to figure out some of these supply demand dynamics here. I guess that from a sentiment standpoint, from a risk asset standpoint, I feel like we're where we were in the summer, where all the calls for the summer driving season and this and that, whatever, and we saw crude getting near 80 bucks and everyone's like, we're going to go right through the fall into the winter and OPEC's not going to do this and that or whatever. And what happened? It went down 20% and the stock market really loved that. So here we are. And I think Danny just made this point in a way, the stock market has not loved high 70s crude and has not loved interest rates going higher. But I'll just tell you this, guy, if you think rates are going higher, then the dollar's going higher. Then it takes me back to 2014 when the Fed started to taper and 2015 when they came off ZERP. And what happened to crude oil? You guys are all going to tell me it's different this time. Crude oil went down 65% from its highs in late 2013, early 2014 to its lows, I think in 15 or 16 or something like that. So I just kind of don't really believe the fact that we've hit some new normal as it relates to fossil fuels and everything like that. And I think we're likely to probably fail here. I think some of these supply demand disruptions and bottlenecks and all this sort are going to abate and the markets sniff that out ahead of time. Die Hard was one of my favorite movies when it came out. And I'm going somewhere with this, so bear with me. But you may recall one of the characters in that movie, his name, I think, was Harry Ellis. And he was the bearded guy. And he walked into the room and he said, I'm your white knight, Bubala. Do you recall that? I do. Well, it appears as though, Danny, that Vladimir Putin is playing the role of the white knight, which has to infuriate you because I know it infuriates me. Danny Moses, please take it away. Guy, does the name Marion Tinsley mean anything to you at all? Yeah, he played second base for the Mets in 1963. All right, he's the best checkers player ever, and he's American. He's a legend, right? How about Gary Kasparov? Does that name ring a bell? Yes. I actually follow him on the Twitter. He's a genius. It's fascinating how he can recite chess moves over the decades. Fascinating stuff. And he would be from what country? Originally from the Soviet Union. That was the former Soviet Union, Dan. So Russia has been playing chess geopolitically for a long time. And the U.S. just plays checkers in Congress, in fighting everywhere. And everyone else around us is playing chess. So you know what else takes place on November 24th, Guy, is the 
International Chess Championship. It's the best of 14 matches. That's in Dubai. I don't think we're going to be there, but I did just look at the line. Magnus Carlsen, who is from Norway, is minus 450. And Ian Napananichi is Russian, is the underdog. So anyway, something to pay attention to on the line. I like Ian at plus 300. We'll save that for a gambling show. However, what's been going on? All of a sudden, Vladimir Putin comes to the rescue yesterday. Why? Because the European courts decided that they would not block the pathway to Nord Stream 2 being approved. What is Nord Stream 2? That is a pipeline that runs from Russia to Germany. Why is that so important? Well, obviously, Russia has a lot of natural gas and they want to basically control the continent. But more importantly, the current Gazprom pipelines go between Russia, Ukraine, and Poland into Europe. People are worried, and rightfully so, that they'll use that as a political weapon to bypass Poland and Ukraine and basically force them into submission, certainly in the case of Ukraine and Russia gains more power. So while we're laughing over here and figuring out where oil prices and gas prices are going, Vladimir Putin waited till yesterday and then came out once he saw the court say, you know what, I think you guys can go ahead with with this pipeline and said, you know what, we're going to start pumping more gas and hey, OPEC plus, maybe we should produce more energy. So that was what he gave back yesterday. Obviously, we shouldn't trust anything that he's doing. Obviously, he's just gained more power than he's ever had potentially on the energy markets into Europe. That's a very dangerous situation. Shift over to China right now with what's going on. Obviously, we talked about problems in the commercial real estate sector. We've talked about stuff in their banking sector and lending. What about this Taiwan move that they've had that no one's paying attention to? Yeah, you read about it. Well, what comes out today? Turns out the U.S. military has had special ops in Taiwan now for several months training Taiwanese military and selling them, obviously, arms, which I think was known. And so there is conflicts building up around us still to this day. And all we focus on is that we're going to get this debt ceiling pushed out to December. We're going to rally the markets on it. Meanwhile, all this other stuff going on behind the scenes is massively important. And so my rot is the geopolitical risk to the market has been completely underpriced. And when you get out from underneath the obsession of nothing happening in our Congress and you look around what's going on, it's a dangerous situation out there and it's not getting any better. I'm sure that chess match will be uh, aired on the Ocho, the best of 14. I love that, the best of 14, <laughs> which is just remarkable. And that Magnus Carlson dude, he sounded like somebody who was in like World's Strongest Men on ABC Sports back in the day. Listen, one thing you have been, I think they call it en fuego, is your NFL picks have just been ridiculous, Danny. And you've been fleecing Dan Nathan seemingly at every turn. Do you have anything for us before we get out of here? This week's contest. There are some interesting ones. The Giants of New York playing the Cowboys of Dallas in Dallas 4 p.m. game this Sunday sticks out to me. What sticks out to you, Danny? I like Dallas laying the seven against the Giants. They're the better team. Giants came off of a win, but Dallas is the superior team. I lay the seven there. I like the Chargers minus two against the Browns. Baker Mayfield is hurt. San Diego just came off a big win. They could have an emotional letdown, but they're just the better team. So I'll take the Chargers and Dallas. And Dan, I will wait for your answer to see which of the other sides you would like of those, if any, to give you a chance to get whole. And if you lose this week, I think we just take it to the fact that I'm going to allow you to write a check to my favorite charity for $1,000 and just call it a day. I'll take Cleveland getting two on the road. Danny Moses. Wow. So there you go. The battle lines have been drawn. By the way, those Baker Mayfield commercials. I tell you what, I didn't like Baker coming out of college. I happen to love the guy now. The game that people should watch, two shitty teams playing in London where maybe seven people show up, would be the Falcons of Atlanta playing the Jets off their first victory of the year of New York. We'll see. Dan Nathan has some closing comments. All right, so guy, last week I trolled the heck out of you with that episode title, as I previously said. This week, you don't even know what's going to happen. You're going to have to log into the podcast store or go down to it, however you get your podcast, because we're trolling you again this week, buddy, with the episode title. I love being trolled. Listen, I get trolled on the Twitter. I get trolled all over the place. I mean, people come knock on my door and talk shit. It's amazing. So if I have to go to the podcast store to get trolled, why not? Folks, when we come back, Katie Stanton, followed by... TV's Melissa Lee. With CME Group Micro Futures and Options, you can get the same access and capital efficiencies of our standard contracts with less upfront financial commitment. Diversify your portfolio and add flexibility by trading CME Group Micro Contracts in Precious Metals, FX, Energy, and Equity Indices. Learn more about what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com backslash micros. Katie Stanton is the founder and general partner of Moxie Ventures. Moxie is an early stage venture firm backing founders who are making life and work better, as well as building solutions to help us heal our planet. Prior to Moxie, Katie served in numerous executive operating roles at Twitter, Google, Yahoo, and Color. 
She has led teams in marketing, comms, recruiting, product, and media. In addition to working in Silicon Valley, Katie served in the Obama White House and State Department and began her career as a banker at J.P. Morgan Chase. Katie sits on the board of Vivendi, a French multinational media company headquartered in Paris, and previously served on the board of Time Inc. Katie started her venture career as a founding partner of Hashtag Angels and has invested in 50 early stage companies, including Airtable, Cameo, Carta, Coinbase, Literati, Modern Fertility, Shape Security, and Threads. Katie, welcome to On the Tape. Thank you for having me. We're in the centennial state. Did you know that it's called the centennial state? Colorado? I did know that. Did yes, you? yes, right. yes I you're did. Like yes. A, you're like a new resident here. Have you I learned am. a lot of a lot of things about Boulder, Colorado? Yeah, I've learned like how sunny it is, it's and right? it's beautiful. Yeah. There's fall foliage. Yeah. It's very seasonal. Though the one thing I have learned, which is a little bit tricky about Colorado seasons, is that spring and fall last about a week. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a long summer and a long yeah. winter. Yeah. Well, the Centennial State, have you also figured out in Boulder, there's a couple famous houses. We're only going to talk about one of them. You and I probably grew up watching Mork and Mindy. Have you gotten, have oh, you yes. figured that one out? For right. sure. Just want to make sure you got Super that. happy about Mork and Mindy, yeah. Nanu Nanu. And I've learned about Columbine as state yeah. flower. And that's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great state. My twin brother moved here, as you know, 13 years ago. So I've been coming every year since then. We usually come once in the summer. We come for the Boulder Creek Fest. Did you do that? Or they probably canceled it. Over I COVID. didn't do it. No. That's awesome. And then we come and ski in the winter usually. And we'll spend a few days here. And then we'll go up to Vail or something like that. So I'm sure you're all over that. Yeah, I love it. It's so beautiful. So many different places. So much to explore. The people are great. So I'm enjoying it. All right. Well, here's the deal. You got to follow Katie because she tweets out pictures of her morning hikes with her <laughs> dogs. It's really beautiful. All right. So Katie, we're here together. It's great to be in studio together. We met through a mutual friend, Sally Shin, who I worked with. She was running a lot of big tech stuff at CNBC for a long time. I was starting on the tape podcast with Guy and Danny, and then we were going to start this new tech podcast. And I said to Sally... I need a fantastic female investor, operator, this or whatever, to join our team for this new tech pod. And she literally, number one, she said, Katie Stanton. That's so amazing. I paid her a lot of money. Well, it's really interesting. So this goes back a couple of years ago when you launched your fund, Moxie, the first fund. I remember just seeing a lot of people that I know, some ex-Twitter people, Adam Bain, Sarver, these guys just kind of tweeting out, Katie's the best, Katie's this. I was like, who the heck is this Katie? So you got tons of fans all over the place. That's very nice of you to say. I'm not sure that's totally true, but right. I appreciate it. All right. And this is a little bit of a tease because we are going to be launching another podcast called OK Computer. It's O-K-A-Y Computer. And we're going to get into all that at another time, but we really wanted Katie to come on the tape so you guys could get to know her a little bit. You could hear about her background. It's truly fascinating. Long history as an operator with some of the most influential tech companies, as you already heard. She worked at the White House. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to talk about what she's doing with Moxie, which I think is really unique. Unique, and I love your move here to Boulder to do that for your second fund. So that's pretty cool. Thank you for having me. And yeah. thank you, Sally. All right. Well, are we excited to do OK Computer here? Because I've listened to you. So when Sally made the intro, I listened to you. I went to the podcast store and I put your name in there. And you've been on a lot of podcasts and you're really good at it. But are you ready to be a host of a podcast? Um, we shall see. <laughs> I don't really feel like I'm ready to be on a podcast. I'm not sure the world needs to hear more from me, but I'm happy to try. So Katie asked numerous times over like Slack and email. I was like, who's our audience? I was like, don't worry. You have a big audience. They're going to find you. They want more of you. That's the bottom line here. Okay. So we're going to do this together. It's going to be a lot of fun. So Rick Heitzman of First Mark Capital is going to be one of our co-hosts. And we put together this great group, a collective, if you will. We're going to call it OK Computer Collective. Melton Demers from CoinShares. We have Jared Dicker from the Churnin Group. Hacky McCormick from Not Boring Capital and his newsletter. And then also Sally Shin is going to join us. We're going to look at tech through three lenses, public markets, private markets, and the media. And then this is really the exciting part. And I think we're like some of us older people, older tech folks. Speak for yourself. The <laughs> intersection between Web2, which you've made a name for yourself, investing in amazing companies, amazing founders, as Rick has, and then Web3, which our group of collective, they're all over it. They're massive thought leaders. So that's going to be fun. I'm super excited. Right. Let's go. All right, let's do it. All let's right, it. let's talk about your career in tech because it is storied. When I started trading public markets, tech in particular, Yahoo was like the big dog. Yahoo was it, right? In the late 90s, it was Yahoo, it was AOL, a bunch of companies that really don't exist anymore. Obviously, Amazon, eBay very much exist. Yahoo still exists. Yahoo just was taken private by Apollo. Have you followed that a little bit? Because Verizon, it sounds like they had some ideas about what to do with that. And AOL, they pushed together some late 90s, early 2000s tech stuff. Didn't really work. Apollo wanted it. Are you surprised? 
surprised that a private equity firm sees the sort of value in, in a Yahoo right now. I'm not surprised because there are so many people who still love and use Yahoo every day. And I'm super excited to see Jim Lanzone join a CEO. And super fun fact, when I was at Google, which I joined after Yahoo, my job was helping to syndicate our search results and our search ads. And we did that to Lycos, to AOL, and a company called Ask Jeeves. And Jim Lanzone was our lead. He was on the other side of the table when we were trying to sell Google results to Ask Jeeves. And Jim asked me the hardest questions. I mean, he was such a pain in the ass, but like in a good way. Can I say that word? Yeah, that okay? you, you All right. say whatever you want. Uh, I don't yeah, say yeah. the F word because my mom listens and okay. I know that she'd be oh, disappointed. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just saying in general. Okay, in general. Okay. But I love Jim. I think he's super yeah. smart. He asks great questions. He's been around the block. He's done lots of different things. And I think he's exactly the right person to kind of bring back a lot of the glory and the uniqueness that is Yahoo. So I'm like really excited. Yeah. I talked to a lot of people in New York um, around this. And last summer, you know, when the SPAC craze was going crazy, everyone was running around as like wanted to be a sponsor and put together a group and the money was there and that sort of thing. I was just thinking about financial media in general. And I was thinking about some of the trends in 2020 where a lot of people were stuck at home. They had stimulus money. There were no sports. And all these entrants came into the stock market, right? So if you were like a daily fantasy sports player or you gambled on games, so people were doing that in the stock market. And it got me thinking, I was like, man, People don't get how massive Yahoo Sports and Yahoo Finance, their audiences are still. And the idea of the intersection between where they play, to me, sounds really interesting. I think there's something to do there. I'll bet that's some part of what's going to happen next is like everything's being gamified. You have a massive audience, like figure out how to better monetize it, right? Yeah. Yahoo Finance was the first job I ever had that I loved. It made me realize, oh, my God, you can love your job. And Yahoo Finance had that first mover advantage. I helped build Google Finance, and I thought that would be way better than Yahoo Finance. And it just never took off the same way that Yahoo Finance did. So it's incredible that it has this longevity. I have no idea how big the team is, but I can bet that it's not very big at all. It's basically on cruise control and that it itself has not been disrupted. But maybe it won't be anytime soon because Jim can come back and give it a little bit of support and love and help Yahoo Finance fulfill its potential. It's funny because we're going to get to your private investing, and I'm sure every investment that you make, that company is looking to disrupt an incumbent or some existing process or something like that. And it's really interesting to me because then the next company in Silicon Valley you worked at is Twitter. And Twitter, there's no one competing with Twitter for all intents and purposes of what they do really well, except for the fact that their audience is not growing. They're kind of stuck at whatever the metric is, is like daily monetizable. It's like a 200 million. And when you think about Facebook at two and a half billion, you know, like it's just crazy. And then you- Or TikTok I, within a short amount of time, the fastest to get to a billion users. That's right. So that's actually really interesting. That was where I was going is TikTok, because it wasn't born here in the US, it just kind of took US by storm a little bit. It's a little surprising. What do you think the potential for other billion user social mobile apps are? Because there haven't been too many, even Snap is stuck below 300. Million and they're not growing at the sort of rate that you would think that could get them to a billion anytime soon, right? I never could have imagined anything would grow faster than Facebook, but I think that's what we just need to realize that innovation will continue to surprise us and that maybe TikTok, there's going to be something that gets to a billion dollars even faster than TikTok. And it's interesting too, I was looking at their market cap today for a different reason, something like 140 billion, and the main investor is the China Investment Fund. That's so bizarre. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, and it's really funny that they were going to be forced to sell their U.S. operations. Right. Supposedly, that was never going to happen. People are like, Microsoft, Walmart? Why are they? Because they're going to get it for a song if it's a for sale or something like that. But that never happened here. So that was your path through Silicon Valley. Pretty absolutely amazing. What about the White House? When did you go to the White House? Was it in between Google and Twitter? Exactly. Yeah. So I'd always been very interested in politics and I studied political science undergrad. I had an internship after grad school on Capitol Hill and was always kind of fascinated, but really loved what I was doing in Silicon Valley and tech. And when I was at Google, one of my side jobs was working on what we call this elections team which was like a hodgepodge Subverting of all Subverting the- elections, is that what you mean? <laughs> no, oh, that was Twitter. I'm yeah, sorry. No, That, that was okay. Facebook. <laughs> yeah, that was Facebook. Yeah. That was a place I never worked. Yeah. And so what we did, we tried to bring all the different tools that Google had, if it were Google Spreadsheets and YouTube at the time, it was very early. And we pitched those to the various different campaigns, both Democrats and Republicans. And I got to know the Obama team pretty well. And I happened to have been a supporter, an early supporter, and had volunteered on his campaign. And when he won- 
very excited mm-hmm. and I got a call. And I was actually also talking to Twitter about joining them in 2008. So of course I made the economically disastrous decision to say like, no, I don't want to join this you know, hot company early. I want to go serve in government. Twitter was what, a year or two old at that point? Yeah. Wow. But I do believe in public service. I do believe everyone should try to figure out how to do public service locally, at the state level, nationally. And here was this moment in time. And I was so captivated by President Obama. I thought he was such an amazing leader. And I thought the campaign did so many things right. And I thought, well, what a great opportunity. I don't want to look back and regret this. And I wanted to have this front row seat to history. So ended up going out to D.C., took the red eye every Sunday night, worked Monday through Friday, came back. It was just a whole hot mess. Then my family, we all moved out to D.C. But it was really, really fascinating. I learned so much. And you don't regret it, I assume. I don't regret it, no. How long were you there? I was there for almost two years. So I spent a year working in the White House, and then I had about eight months or so working at the State Department. And that was a really interesting opportunity as well. The Foreign Service officers that I met along the way, they are so high integrity. They are so brilliant. Would you go back? I would go back for the right role, but not now. On your Twitter page, whatever that thing is above your avatar, is a picture of you with President Biden now. Was it then Vice President Biden? Is that picture, is that what that's from? No, that was actually two years ago now. And so he came out to Silicon Valley and I offered to have a fundraiser for him at my house. And I love that picture. He was such a great person. I'm a big fan, but I really regret there that I did not have my house painted. So if you look close (laughs) enough, you can see the paint peeling in the background and it's pretty embarrassing. Well, you know, listen, he's Joe from Pennsylvania. There's no heirs there. No. And And can I share a little fun tidbit about Joe? So when he came, I also have twins. I have boy-girl twins. And my daughter, Kiki, had just had her wisdom teeth taken out. And she looked like a big chipmunk. I mean, her face was so swollen. And she was so embarrassed and she was really excited to meet him. And and I had made some kind of joke about it in front of Joe Biden. And so he came and spoke to everybody and talked about his plans if he were to become president. And it was a very nice afternoon. About a week later, we got this big delivery and he sent 20 pints of ice cream and said, hey, Kiki, I hope this helps. And thank you so much for hosting us at your house. It was just a very thoughtful thing to do. Obviously, he wasn't in the car calling the ice cream guy (laughs) to do it ahead of team, but he was the one who had this idea and sent it. And I really appreciate that. I think that's, you know, just one of the things like we don't really talk a whole heck of a lot of politics on here. I think people who watched me on CNBC know where I sit on a lot of this stuff in my old Twitter account. To have someone in there, and of course, every president, every administration are going to make mistakes and they're going to have curveballs and this and whatever. The fact that we don't wake up every morning and have this discourse dictated to us as a nation, as a world, and usually in a divisive manner. I just think that we should all take a step back as we kind of get hopefully towards the end of this pandemic and realize this last year, as bad as it was for a lot of people, could have been a lot worse. So, Joe, keep doing it, man. I'm a big fan about making government boring again. All right, let's talk about that segue, though. So you went to Twitter, and then how did you start investing? Because being an operator, you had all these different amazing roles at these amazing transformative companies that turned into behemoths. How did your eye turn from operating towards investing? So I knew nothing about investing in the private markets. And I had been a banker before I came to Silicon Valley, so I knew a little bit about public markets, but definitely nothing about privates. And it was actually when I was at Google that I had two friends One started an investment fund and one started a company. And I didn't really understand when they said, would you like to invest? It's like, what does that mean? Well, you give us money and maybe we return it in 10 to 15 years and you might lose it all. It's very risky. And I said, okay, I didn't have a lot of money at the time, but I made those investments. And I was lucky enough because I invested in people who were smart, who were ethical, who had hustle and drive. And one happened to be Chris Saka, who started Lowercase Capital. October 3rd, 2016. So Dan is showing me a picture of him and Chris Saka. That's so funny. You knew where I was going. That was at the event. That's so weird. Yeah. Listen, I did my homework here. So I was at the same event. I'm going to show you a picture. Yeah. So it was October 3rd, 2016. Oh, you were right. I was wrong. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was showing. Basically (laughs) showing- proving that I was wrong. This relationship's off to a great start. If I saw you at the lawn, I would have gone up and taken a picture with you. Well, thank you so much. (laughs) You had no idea who I was then. (laughs) Well, now I do. Now you do? Yeah. Yeah, so Chris was my first investment in a fund. And then there was another guy, Summit Agarwal, who also left Google to go into government, work at the Defense Department, who started a company called Shape Security, which was helping to do better security online. And in both Summit and Chris's case, like here were people, they were very smart. They had a lot of drive and they had a very clear focus of what problem they wanted to solve. So I made those bets. So then fast forward to when I was at Twitter. 
had a little bit more capital at my disposal to invest and started to invest in a few other people's companies. And I had five girlfriends at Twitter. And we're like, hey, are you investing? What are you investing in? What does a C round mean? What does Series A mean? And how do you calculate pro rat? All these basic questions. And it was at one of the women's birthdays, just really, that we're like, you know, how come every time we hear about these companies going public and you hear who's on the cap table, it's always the same cast of characters. And they're always the same white guys who went to Stanford. Where are the women? Where are the people of color? Where are the operators? Where are the people from these diverse experiences that can add a lot of value? And so we were like, well, let's try to become better investors ourselves. And let's also try to remove some of the scaffolding around investing to allow more people to participate. So we call ourselves hashtag angels, you know, a little nod to Twitter, and then threw out a blog post. And we were kind of casual about it. There was no organization. There was no formation or anything. Just the friend group, really. And then all of a sudden, we had all this incoming demand. And all these people were like, cool, where do I sign up? I want to invest. Is this a fund? How does this work? And I remember being on the sell bar line with Vidya, one of the other amazing women on this group. And I was like, oh, my God, Vidya, what have we done? She's like, I don't know. And what are we going to do? And So we just kind of owned it. We're really excited about this platform. We decided to meet every two weeks and just share deal flow, share our questions. And we would always invest individually. But whenever we had access, we would ask permission to share it with other women in our group, but also other women outside of our group, because how can we make this better for everyone? And that really turbocharged my interest and my access really to the venture world. And we would partner with different VCs on a maybe quarterly basis to get to know them, what worked well for them, how could we collaborate, and also to extend the community. And that was really fun. So have you seen any data being a public markets guy? I think that women in public market investing, whether it be institutional or working at investment banks, it's not a huge percentage of the overall. But I think there's been some studies where they've looked at data from female money managers and they like always outperform their male counterparts. Have you seen anything in in the private markets or not? I haven't seen that. That would be a really good thing that we should do. But one of the things that we did observe and quantify is that there were very few women and very few people on these cap tables of successful companies. And we ended up partnering with Carta and Henry Ward, who's CEO and co-founder, and said, well, is there a way that we can quantify how much equity and how much ownership goes, at least starting with women, because at the time they didn't have any race data. And I think this was in 2018. I can double check. We did this study and we looked at something like 6,500 companies and to look across founders, investors, executives, and early employees, because those are the real roads to wealth if you're early enough and you get these things right. And the TLDR here is that only 9% of that equity and that ownership went to women. There's a huge gap. There's a big salary gap, right? You know, women making, what, 80 cents of the dollar. But if you look at it by race and if you look at it by ownership too, it's far worse. Give us the 411 on Moxie. Why did you do it? What is your differentiation? You're here in Boulder, an amazingly entrepreneurial sort of place, right? It is, know, yeah. Is. is that part of the inspiration, the move here too, to kind of get bigger? And Boulder was random. Yeah, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so I can explain that. But Moxie wasn't. So what happened was I had been an active angel investor, had invested in 40 companies, and I thought I should do this full time. Yeah. And obviously I should just join a VC. And I started talking to my friends in VC and they were like, don't join VC. You know what you're doing. You just need money. And you also need courage. Go for it. What's holding you back? And I thought about it. I'm like, I think they're right. And that's why I called it Moxie. Like, I need to have the guts and the courage to do this. But it is scary. Any founder journey is very scary. You don't want to fail. You don't know how much you can raise. You don't know how successful you'll be or not. And so... I went out and started talking to a lot of people I admire, including Chris Saka, who also read me the riot act, why I should do this. So thank you, Chris. And raised 25 million by myself and realized that I wanted to be part of a positive difference. I wanted to make sure I had agency over the deals that I was backing, the founders I was backing, and backing missions that I thought made life or work better. And so I do believe profit and purpose can coexist and we don't have enough proof points. And so I wanted to be able to be part of that equation. And so I've been very privileged and fortunate to be able to find all these amazing founders for Moxie One. I think we have 28 companies in the portfolio today. And there are a range of some enterprise, some fintech, some health tech. The category I'm spending the most time is in climate tech because I think it's our most urgent problem. I'm not a scientist and this is not a climate fund, but I think all of us can be part of the solution somehow. And then fund two 
I'm also very lucky to now have a partner based in Boulder named Alex Redder. Mm-hmm. He's someone I worked with at Google and at Twitter, who is a software engineer. He led all of engineering at Twitter. Right. And he's also a pilot and was president of Kitty Hawk, obviously, oh, wow. <laughs> random. Yeah. And Alex and I have been sharing a lot of deal flow over the years. And he's just a very clear thinker. He's very technical. And so we're going to build Moxie 2 together. And we're also hiring a principal. If anyone's interested, let me know. <laughs> Slide into my DMs, yeah. looking for someone younger and cooler than both of us. <laughs> but same principle. So things that make life and work better, things that help heal our planet, early stage, anything before the A, whatever that means. Yeah. I've heard pre-seed, seed plus, pre-A, whatever it is, yeah. it has to be early. It sounds like you have a different mission. You're focused on founders who are underrepresented as access to capital and access to resources, that sort of thing. You're focused on, it doesn't seem like you're solely focused on climate tech. What is the differentiating factor that you and Alex bring when you're going to line up with some founders here and try to invest in lead rounds? And what are some of the things that differentiate you guys? I think the biggest thing is that we're operators by background. We have built and scaled companies and we've been around many blocks that we have a pretty good network. And so the key things, the common things that all of our founders need help with versus hiring. Is this the right job spec? How do I recruit? How do I close these different candidates? Because it's very competitive. Mm-hmm. A second common thing that they all need, especially those in enterprise that go to market. How do I set pricing? How do I build a sales team? How do I meet the head of customer success at ABC company? And so we have a lot of those relationships and we have a lot of those experiences. And maybe the last thing is that we're very honest and we care deeply. And this is our life's work right now. We're so excited to bring our collective experiences and networks to help benefit all of our founders. Let me ask you this, though. When you think about some of these missions that you're focused on, I was at Code last week and Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, was there and Stephanie Rule from MSNBC and Kara Swisher, obviously, of Recode were interviewing Mark and they were really kind of pressing him. He likes to kind of tweak the Facebook crew there and Zuckerberg in particular. And it was a really interesting conversation because they were talking about trust and safety and regulation and all this sort of stuff. And the Wall Street Journal had that really exhaustive, what they were calling the Facebook files at the time. So each day they were doing over the last, let's say, week and a half, a new report based on leaked documents. And some was about what Insta is doing to teens and all that sort of stuff. It just seems like one thing after another here. I kind of think that Facebook and Guy has said it on many occasions, and we're going to talk about it on OK Computer a lot. They're going to fall under ESG investing very soon. So I'm just curious how you think about that as you're investing. And what do you think about some of these large incumbents? Remember, it's like do no evil, but it seems like all they're doing is a lot of evil as it relates to our democracy and our health. It's a really interesting debate. And I think a lot of companies, they're well-intentioned at the beginning. And then all of a sudden they get investor pressure and then maybe they get public market pressure. And then they start skimming on the edges and think like, well, we're doing this still because we want to grow and they justify it somehow. Maybe we're employing more people or providing better investor returns, blah, blah, blah. You can talk yourself into anything, right? And so we don't really call it trust and safety, but I think Mark is generally thematically right. We think about The companies we back, they do no harm and they have to be climate positive, for example. So we don't invest in things like DTC. We would obviously never invest in fossil fuels. Like we're trying to make sure that things are going to help heal our planet. It's going to help us reduce our carbon emissions somehow. I was lucky at Twitter that I work with some of the best trust and safety people. Mm -hmm. So Del Harvey, who still leads trust and safety and Vijay Gade, who's the chief legal accountant. They are so high integrity and very thoughtful. I don't know the Facebook team at all, but clearly they're doing it wrong. And this is not a great outcome for billions of people, as you see fake news spread and all the different things that are occurring. And I haven't read the Facebook files. It's one of my plans this weekend because I'm very curious about it. But that's been a real shit show to watch. All right. Well, I think we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Facebook and all the ills going on over there on OK Computer. And not just because what's gone on there as it relates to what they're doing or not doing. I think that a lot of this kind of Web 2, Web 3 intersection is going to be focused on big centralized platforms like that. And so I think that's going to be a great topic of conversation for us going forward. We spent a lot of time here. I think it was a good little preview. Hopefully our audience gets to know Katie Stanton and Moxie a little bit. I hope you're going to come back and you're going to check us out on OK Computer later in the month when we launch that. So Katie, tell everybody, where can they find you? Where can they find Moxie? Where do you live online? So obviously on the Twitter, so you can follow us at Moxie Ventures, and it's two X's, so M-O-X-X-I-E, two X's for the female chromosome. And then you can email us at hello at moxie.vc. All right, Katie, thanks for joining us on the tape. We look forward to having you on OK Computer. Enjoy Boulder, beautiful fall here, and go Buffs. And when we come back, Guy and I sit down with CNBC's Melissa Lee on her new doc, Generation Gamble. 
Hey, it's Dan here. I wanted to let you know about a brand new podcast from Risk Social Media called Breaking Even with former golf pro Ned Michaels. We cover everything from golf to real estate, options trading, and sports betting. Each week, Ned is joined by some of the biggest names in golf and sports handicapper, Jonathan Coachman. Guy Danny and I drop by to attempt to fix Ned's swing at the markets. New episodes drop every Thursday, so follow it in your favorite podcast store and don't forget to leave us a review. Melissa Lee is the host of CNBC's Fast Money and Options Action. She also just released a new documentary called Generation Gamble, where she takes viewers on a journey to the intersection of online betting, trading, and gaming. In the doc, she profiles the Gen Z consumers and social media influencers behind the surge, explores the companies capitalizing on the trend, and interviews experts trying to raise awareness about the potential pitfalls. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out. It re-airs several times this weekend, including Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Well, I'm fired up because Melissa Lee is back her second time with us. I mean, how excited? Be honest, Melms. You're fired up about this, aren't you? Am I making history? OTT history? I, you know what? I th- Sort of. We had two dudes with the same first name on, this guy Porter Collins and Vincent Daniel. So they've done it twice. But you have now been... I think our third guest to be on twice, if my math is correct. Is that correct, yeah. Dan Nathan? Maybe the first the first female guest to be on twice. No, and, and you know what? Uh-huh. And you are, you know you're my favorite. And I will tell you that Generation Gamble, which, what do they call it when you drop a podcast, Dan? It, it, it's called dropping a podcast. Well, they CNBC dropped that sucker on Tuesday night. They went right up against the Yankee game against the Red Sox. <laughs> and I bet you you kicked its rear end, Mel. Congratulations on yet another incredible documentary. Thank you very much. Mel, we got to go back. What's the theme in your docs? Because I've been watching your docs now for 10 years on CNBC. There was something from the cannabis family. There was one in the porn. Um, Now we're doing gambling. I mean, you got like a little vice streak in you, don't you? (laughs) Odd, considering I don't do any of the (laughs) aforementioned things or partake in them at all. I like to see what's hot in the investing world, what is really sort of resonating at that moment in time in popular culture and the stock market and and try to do something on that so it's more timely and more interesting. Yeah. Well, no, actually, you know, I remember the Bitcoin one was great. That was like during the height of the craze, right? the last retail craze in 17, early 18. That was amazing. And I actually want to take you all the way back. Coca-Cola was the first one that I remember doing when we started doing options action together. So that was awesome. All right. Let's dig into this generation gamble guy, because sometimes do you style yourself as a stock market operator? which would kind of insinuate maybe there's some gambling aspect to what we do here. Is that kind of what we were going for, Mel, when you uh, started doing the fast money or when guys started doing the fast money like 37 years ago? (laughs) When I started doing it. It is called fast money. (laughs) And there is, listen, there's an aspect of it without question. I mean, the two worlds have now collided. And you know what I find interesting, Mel, and I think you would admit to this as well. I think a lot of the things that we talk about on the show, I think it creates and spurs some ideas. And that's where these documentaries are born from. And quite frankly, what we saw between the period of, I guess, you know, April of 2020 up until the end of the year, we saw a lot of people that had prior were betting on sports and they found their way into the stock market. And I think that probably sort of lit the dock fuse underneath you. But a lot of similarities there. A lot of similarities in terms of just the attitude toward money, the attitude toward wanting to bet on a direction of something, whether it be an outcome of a game or the direction of a stock, it's all the same. I mean, psychologically, it's all the same too. And it's physiologically the same as well when you take a look at the reaction in the brain. We talked to an expert over at UCLA. He treats gambling addiction. He's been doing this for 20 years. And he said, it's the same. If you you do a, a scan of the brain when you're making a trade or winning a bet, you see the same things fire. You see the same areas of the brain light up. So that just tells you how similar it is. It's not just in theory it's similar. It's actually similar to your body and how you feel. Yeah. So for years, you know, as we've kind of talked about markets and talk about risk taking on fast money and options action, I mean, we really try to be careful of not calling things bets, right? Like we, we didn't want to like kind of dumb it down to that when you're an entrant in the market and you're thinking about being a fast money player, that you're not gambling. And were we kind of diluting ourselves the whole time and did this last year with all these new entrants to the market and the explosion in crypto trading, the explosion in daily fantasy or in-game fantasy, 
and you know, and Robin Hood trading and meme stocks and all the options trading. Have we been deluding ourselves the whole time? Is it all just the same thing? Is that what you learned from this? I think that there are a lot of similarities. I think that we have in the past spoken to an audience who is willing to make a bet, so to speak, a shorter term horizon. I mean, that's why we call it fast money, riding the momentum. With this new generation, though, the way they view investing is completely different, I think, than our traditional audience. They see this as the way to make money. This is the way to make millions. And social media plays into this as well. I mean, they're Instagram influencers, TikTok influencers with millions of followers, and they tell you to buy this stock or, you know, how to do technical analysis or buy this cryptocurrency or NFT. People listen to them. I mean, that's this generation. They're not getting their information necessarily from us. They want something even faster, you know, of instant gratification. They want to make the trade, make the money. They want to see the green arrows go up every 10 minutes when they're checking the Robinhood app. What have you learned, though? Where are they, that age group, on the risk spectrum as opposed to a dinosaur like myself? I mean, it feels as if they've really pushed themselves out the risk curve. Did you get that sense as well? I don't want to make extreme generalities, but you know, if you ask sort of the average person within our doc who we talk to what is in their portfolio, they'll probably say something like Tesla, Neo, Dogecoin, maybe Bitcoin, but even Bitcoin is relatively slow (laughs) for them. It's the Dogecoin that they're after. So they have a completely different tolerance for risk. They're willing to make take the risk. And it's funny because part of this is that they don't actually feel the money leave their hands. Everything is electronic and that makes it a lot easier, whether it be online investing or online betting. You're not taking the money to a casino. There's no sort of friction to that final decision. It's immediate. You say 100 send and 100 bucks goes into your account. And even before it clears, you can go ahead and and make the bet or make the trade. You know, we've talked a lot about meme stocks, if if you will, over the course of the last year. And, you know, Guy and I have kind of made the point. I think last time you were on the podcast, we talked about it. There's always been meme stocks, right? And I think your point about the access to being able to track these things and discuss them and for things to go viral, you know, and that and kind of affect the price. That's what's really new right here. We haven't talked to you in months since on this topic on the on the podcast. Has anything changed in the last six months? Because to my thought process, there's really only two meme stocks anymore. It's AMC and it's GameStop. And for all intents and purposes, the market caps are not particularly important here. You know what I mean? And when you look at crypto, there's a lot of stuff going on. And then you look at the billions and billions of dollars being turned over every day in sports betting and in-game betting and that sort of thing. What's your sense here? Is this here to stay? Is is, is there staying power to this? Or is it going to take a bear market to kind of wipe a lot of this kind of excess liquidity out of the markets? I mean, I think it's always easy to call yourself a genius when markets are going higher. I think that's the bottom line. I think a bear market will flush a lot of enthusiasm out. But, you know, with that said, the meme stock phenomenon, and particularly when it comes to GameStop and AMC, it's lasted much longer than I think any of us have ever thought it would last. And the thing that is a common thread is that, you know, there is a social media component that definitely helps this movement, so to speak, continue. You're not alone in this trade. Everybody has their reasons for for being in a trade, whether it be just to make money or to stick it to the man or to try and enact market changes when it comes to payment for order flow or dark pools or naked short selling. All of these things are sort of in the currents of the conversations on social media when it comes to meme stocks. And I think that is sort of like a, a reinforcing mechanism. When we talk to gambling experts, the thing that they say about casinos is that there's always intermittent reinforcement. And I think that's the same with sort of these meme stocks and social media. You're always, you're going to log on, you're going to go to Wall Street Batch, you're going to go to Twitter or YouTube, and you get that intermittent reinforcement mechanism that says you're in this trade and it's going to be a winning trade. And so you stay. You know, you want to go into these things open-minded, eyes wide open, but as human beings, there are always some preconceived notions we have. It's just the nature of the beast. I'm sure that was true with you. Did you walk away saying, wow, I didn't realize this was going on or something that really surprised you on the way out of the dock? I think I was surprised at the extreme tilt toward risk taking that this generation has, the willingness to put a sizable chunk of their paycheck into a Dogecoin or a meme stock or or something like that and, and not even think that you necessarily need to 
have the ballast of a Microsoft or some sort of big cap name. Maybe that'll come with age. And maybe it's different because this generation, you know, they're coming of age. They had to face a pandemic. They were locked up for a long time. They also saw their parents lose a lot of money, probably during the financial crisis. There are different factors involved in the psyche of this particular generation. I think it'll be interesting to see if these attitudes towards risk, which seem to be very different from past generations, will actually persist as as this cohort gets older. You know, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned the term entertainment. And, you know, when we were growing up, the whole idea is if you wanted to put a little action on a game to make it a little bit more interesting, you had to kind of find a bookie or there was someone around who was willing to do that. It was illegal. And so now with sports betting and a lot of states having legal sports betting, is it going to go beyond entertainment? Because, you know, we just had the CEO of FanDuel on, on Fast Money last night, and she was talking about spending hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire customers. Right. And so they're trying to create addictive behavior the same way a lot of these social media platforms and the like. And so I guess my question to you is, is this just the tip of the iceberg of sports betting? And is it going to be way more than just entertainment? This is going to become a massive business and it doesn't have the potential to rival stock trading or crypto trading. I mean, I think that we don't even know how big this could be. And we're talking about just sports betting, but there's also eye gaming. So playing cards or slots or, you know, whatever it is online as well. And so imagine putting all of Las Vegas and casino and then all of the sports betting world on a single app. And that is what we're talking about. I don't think that we have any concept right now as to how big this market will actually end up being, because I think that the appeal is going to be so broad and people look forward to booking a trip to Vegas or whatnot. Imagine if you could do that 24 seven from wherever you are. That's the world that we're going to be in. If sports betting and, and iGaming, if that's all legalized across the country, because right now it's only, you know, mobile betting is 16 states, it'll be interesting to see if this creates a wave of addicts. I think we don't know what the ramifications are. I'm not going to sit here and say everybody who who online gambles or online bets or online invests is going to be an addict or going to lose their shirts. That's not the case. There are plenty of people who are only going to bet a couple bucks. 25 cents is the skin in the game sort of bet that DraftKings, the average bet is 25 cents. That's very little. If people can control themselves, that's not a problem. But this certainly opens a door to addictive behavior to a bigger group of people. And so we won't know what the consequences are probably for a generation. So Mel, earlier you, you mentioned that you talked to some addiction specialists and we all know horse racing and sports betting and all that sort of thing. That's primarily and, and obviously slots and, and Vegas and cards and stuff has been the focus of, of gambling addiction. With all of these new entrants to the stock market and the ease in which people can get in and out of trading stocks, are we starting to see people addicted to gambling on markets and gambling on crypto? Is that something that's kind of in the purview now of these addiction specialists? 100%. Specialists who used to only see people who would literally physically go to a casino are now seeing people who have never stepped into a casino who are addicted to betting. They are seeing people who are addicted to day trading, who are addicted to cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is a big booming area for, for the addiction treatment market. And they worry that this is going to continue, that there isn't enough research being done in terms of what sort of effect they have on the brain and addiction, there is no federal funding for research. So while we're rushing headlong to legalize betting and to make trading or democratize, et cetera, we really don't know what the longer term impacts are. And there's no money being dedicated to it either. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, I'm sure Guy has plenty to say on this. You know, I've been in institutional trading for 25 years, and it was really interesting that the sort of people that gravitated towards trading, whatever it was, it could have been stocks, it could have been bonds, it could have been anything, currencies. It usually took a specific mindset. And a lot of these guys, and they were usually guys, would tell you, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be betting on the ponies or I'd be doing something else. And is that the sort of mindset now that's starting to kind of work its way into the public. You know, I talked to people who are or were very addicted to some of these apps. And they said, you know, if I had to physically go to a racetrack, if I had to physically go to a casino, I probably wouldn't have that problem. But the fact that I could place a bet on my laptop or my phone, that made it that much easier. So it's it's completely different. Let me ask you this, though, Dan. Do you think if you grew up in this day and age, you would be addicted to Robin Hood? You would be addicted to sports betting? Were you of that ilk? 
Yeah, I, I, I was always interested in it, and I always kind of knew that it was just kind of easy to, to, to bet on anything. I think that guy would tell you that if you find yourself betting throughout the NFL season and then in February betting on the Pro Bowl, you got a little bit of a problem here. Um, that's an old joke among some of us. But I, I can see it. I mean, listen, you know, I've not been deluded to the fact that what we do intraday, if I think the S&P 500 might dip, you know, from a high 1%, the idea of shorting that or buying puts or selling selling futures, that that's not too different than just making a bet, an in-game bet, that the Cowboys down to guys' giants at half by, a, you know, a touchdown and the odds change. What's the difference? Guy, you tell me what's the difference. You've been doing this for decades here. What's the difference in that? I don't think there is a difference. And quite for a lot of people, I feel that they think they have a better edge in sports gambling than they do with the stock market. Because quite, quite frankly, and you probably came across this, Melissa, but I'm sure a lot of people, you heard the term, I think the stock market's rigged. So, you know, I'll take my action and I'll do it on sports where I think at least I have a bit of an edge. I think there's some truth to that. Quite frankly, what we've heard from some of these Fed officials, I think that's whether, again, we talk about it all the time. They did nothing illegal. Everything they did was under the constraints and the purview of uh, the rules that were set up. But people see that and say, you know what, the game is totally rigged. I'm taking my action and I'm going to bet on the Nick game tonight or the Yankee game last night and those types of things. I'm sure there's a lot of that that sort of permeated the discussions you had. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That and and also, you know, one reason to be in a trade yourself may be to shed light on how the market is rigged because you feel like you're part of a bigger movement. So, I mean, I think that there's sort of this anti-institution, anti-establishment streak in this generation as well. Look at what happened with the financial crisis in terms of Wall Street's roles. I mean, we're going to trust these guys again. No, we're going to take matters into our own hands. We're going to invest our own money and we're going to find our own information. And we don't need mainstream media, CNBC, the Wall Street Journal, et cetera. We got it all covered on social media. Yeah, it's funny, though. You know, Mel, I, I think that Guy and I and you, we've met like hundreds. You probably met thousands of fans of Fast Money over the years. And I think that there's a certain component of it that they do view it as entertainment. They do see us as characters playing a role in their game as they think about markets. And for years, you know, I've always kind of said to people, what I think about trading is that you take a percentage of your investable assets, right? If you think that you know something about your industry that you work in or that you just enjoy the action, well, then you do that with a small percentage of it. Everyone should kind of think about things, how to kind of gain wealth over a long period of time being fairly conservative. So there is a certain part of it that I think is fun. These are all stories. Elon Musk is the most brilliant character that exists on any medium out there. And you can invest in that or you can bet against that. That's fun stuff. And I get what these people feel about the meme stuff. You know what I mean? Because it is interesting. I just don't buy stuff sticking it to the man. I just think that sooner or later, all the chickens are going to come home to roost. You just can't have capital chasing unproductive ideas. And, you know, Elon Musk and Tesla is the one example where they proved it all wrong because everybody in your mother, including me, wanted to bet against it. It was uneconomical. They weren't making profitable cars. They were doing this. They were doing that. Well, he's laughing all the way to the bank. An $800 billion market cap company, 50 or 60 percent of the global market cap of autos. He won. It's over. And it's not only Tesla. It's Bitcoin. Think of the beginning days of Bitcoin. No one's institutions were in Bitcoin. They laughed at Bitcoin. They're like, nobody's going to use it. It's not going to be any form of cryptocurrency or store of value. That's all bunk. But here we are today. Bitcoin's a completely different story. And so it's the same thing. Did Wall Street really know? Was Wall Street that much smarter when it came to these two just astronomical market changing stories? They were caught off sides. They were wrong. And retail investors got it right. Well, Mel, your documentaries do kick ass. And yes, I'm allowed to say that on this format or whatever. They, what do they call these things, Dan? Whether we do a podcast, but they call it they call it a podcast. You know, all of them have been amazing. What are you working on now? I'm working on a documentary specifically about AMC, the movement behind it, the people who are invested in AMC, why they're in it, how they are changing the market, how they might continue to change the market. We've seen the SEC chairman address some of the concerns of this movement. So Wall Street's taking notice. It's not like these guys are just there and, and people are ignoring them. They're 80% of the shareholders of AMC. So they're shaking things up. And I think that that's worth looking into. I would call that documentary AMC, grab the popcorn, folks. That's just me. I'm sure you'll come <laughs> up with something much better, Mel. <laughs> 
Mel, thanks for joining Dan and I on the tape. Thanks once again to CME Group for sponsoring this episode of On the Tape. If you liked what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show and we love hearing from you. And we also want to hear from you via email at onthetape at riskreversal.com any time of the day. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod, and we'll see you next time. On The Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. (laughs) 